Greetings, everyone. Welcome once again to another Sure Foundation book study. Amen. What everyone should know about the God of the Holy Bible by my pastor, Brother James W. Knox. And you can find this book and many others on the church website. He has written over 30 books, I believe. Uh, I believe that's where we're at, up to 30 books or more. And you can find these books again on the church website at www. Dot jameswnox.org and we will be finishing up this book today so let's flip this around and get started all right welcome everyone i greet you as always in the name of our lord and savior jesus christ who is the lamb of god which taketh away the sin of the world and we are at the end of the sure foundation book we have flown through this book and the last uh topic was the humanity of christ and now we are going to be talking about the grace of God. Hallelujah, the grace of God. <clears throat> okay, so let's get started here. And if you have the 2004 edition of this book, it will be on page 198, way back in the back of the book. All right, so let's uh, get started. As Brother James starts out, as he wrote here, he says, We have come a long way since we began these lessons. Yes, we have. And you're welcome to go back and find all those lessons. If you don't want to scroll down on my Facebook page to find those, you can always go to my YouTube page, Ambassador for Christ, or type in uh, uh, Scott Messenger uh, messages uh, <laughs> and look them up that way. Amen. All right, so let's get started here. Again, he says, we have come a long way since we began these lessons. And he says, and I hope and pray you have a much better understanding of the God of the Bible than you had when you first started this little volume. So, friend, I hope you have a better understanding if you've really, truly paid attention to these broadcasts and followed along and have uh, read your own copy of the book. hope you have a better understanding if you're truly listening or if you're just half listening. You might not get the whole entirety of it. So I hope you'll pay full attention. Amen. All right, he says, in this lesson, we want to discuss God's dealing with the world in grace. Amen. The marvel of marvels is that God deals in grace, not only with the world of men, but with Satan and his fallen angels as well. The gospel of grace can never be fully understood or appreciated except as this truth is made plain. Again, all the questions as to God's goodness arise out of a failure in understanding at this point. Right. Had God uh, dealt in judgment and not in grace, Satan would have lost his liberty the moment he sinned, and then he could not have tempted others. In turn, each man who sinned would have immediately shared the same fate. Oh boy. Thus, sin would have been weeded out as soon as it appeared, and then God would have would never have been accused of injustice. Why did he not act in this way? We're about to find out. <clears throat> Praise God he didn't act in this way. Number one, point number one, there are only two possible ways of dealing with wrong, judgment or grace. Those are the two, only two options, but God must be impartial. Uh, he must extend grace to all, not just to some, but all, or else to no one. So if you think that God's extending grace to a certain group of people, no, he extends it to all, or it's all or no one. Amen. If God extended grace to some and not to others, that would be unjust and unrighteous. It would be unfair, right? And God is not unfair. So when you go around with your Calvinistic... Uh, approach to God and saying, well, that's just, uh, oh, you know, God chooses who he's going to save and who he, no, right, right here, it would be unfair, it would be unjust and unrighteous, so when God says all, he means all, all men, all men can be saved if they trust Jesus, it's only up to you, you make your own personal decision, I make my own personal decision when I'm going to reject Jesus or trust him as my savior, and same goes with you, so when you start, you know, giving out that that uh, junk, <clears throat> realize that God says that he doesn't want any, A-N-Y, any, that means he doesn't want any to perish, but all to come to repentance. 
not, not everyone's going to come to repentance and believe on Jesus, but that's their own personal decision. And they have to deal with the consequences, just like you have to deal with the consequences of what you do with Jesus and God and all that stuff. So, amen. All right. So, he uh, continues on, says, I realize that there are those who teach that God elected to damn some and to save others. Yeah, just talking about that. Uh, that to some he gave a will to be saved, and to others he never gave any light. <laughs> I understand that people teach that. I would not have that God as far as I could throw the building I am sitting in. Right. That God is unjust. He is not gracious. Let's consider the God of the Bible. Let's consider him, not, not some God you made up in your head. Let's consider the God of the Bible. In Psalm 98, 8-9, the scripture says, Let the floods clap their hands. Let the hills be joyful together before the Lord. For he cometh to judge the earth. With righteousness shall he judge the world and the people uh, with equity. Is God a judge? Yes, he is. Will God judge the earth? Yes, he will. Will God judge people and men? Yes, he will. How? In equity. Romans 2.11 says, For there is no respect of persons with God. So God does not respect anyone. Uh, no respect of persons with God. So, <clears throat> there you have it. God will not deal with a man on the basis of who that man is. Right, so if you think you're somebody special, well, God's going to deal with you the same way he deals with every other man. Are you wealthy, educated, intelligent, and strong? Do you have a good home, a good job, and a good income? Do you provide well for your family? That is wonderful. Yes, it is wonderful. Uh, God is going to deal with you on the basis of his word and your obedience to it, not on the basis of your person. Right. So again, you might be better than the next person, but when you compare yourself to God, none are good. So there you have it. He's going to uh, judge you and deal with you on the basis of his word and your obedience to it, not on the basis of your person. The same will be true of every man. <clears throat> Romans 2.12 declares, For as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law, and as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. <laughs> Again, in John 1.17 we read, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Well, 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 God is the judge. Transgression of the law brings God's judgment. But here we find coming onto the scene of the Lord Jesus Christ, bringing with him grace and truth. Hallelujah. Point number two. Grace is mentioned in the Bible as a method of government. Uh, grace as a method of government is virtually letting men do as they please for a time, even if they do wrong. This is brought out in a message that is recorded in Acts 17, 24-31, preached by the Apostle Paul on Mars Hill to a group of superstitious people who believed in God and worshipped God, who even built an altar to him, but who did not know him. As a matter of fact, the inscription on their altar was, To the unknown God. To these people, the great missionary cried, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord. Are you seeking the Lord? If haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from any one of us, or from every one of us. So God is not far from every one of us. He's nearer than you think. <clears throat> For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of our own poets have said. For we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or a stone graven by art and man's device, 
and the times of this ignorance. Take heed, some of you that uh, reading this were taught by your fathers and mothers to practice image worship and idol worship. And some of you attend churches where there are idols and, or images all over the building, and you call them aids to worship. So take heed of that. God calls this ignorance. Yeah, ignorance. God says that you are ignorant of who he really is. For if you had known the true God, you wouldn't be forming these those images and making those idols and using them as aids to your worship. And continue on in the scripture. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commendeth, commandeth all men everywhere to repent. So he commands all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. Amen. That's Jesus. For several thousand years now, even prior to God's dealing with Satan and the fallen angels, there have been an awful lot of things that God has been allowing. That is, he has been giving man the freedom to do as he chooses, even though the things man is doing many times are very, very wrong. Yeah. In Romans 5.20, the Bible says, Moreover the law entered, that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Hallelujah. You see sin everywhere, great sin, meaning that God bestows great grace. You behold great sinners, meaning that God has shown forth great grace. <clears throat> but let us go on, as we are building to a point, and we need to get all the groundwork laid and the superstructure in place before we can put on the capstone. Amen. <laughs> point number three. The object of grace is twofold to let uh, men have the opportunity of proving in their experience whether their course is good or not, and then to make it possible to extend mercy to them when they do see that they are, gr are wrong. And, amen. Mercy is uh, God giving us what we don't deserve instead of giving us what we do deserve. Amen. That is to say, the reason God doesn't stop you the first time uh, you do wrong is because God wants you to come to the definite heart, far, felt, uh, heartfelt conviction and conclusion that you are wrong, that you are a sinner, and that you have done wrong. God wants you to come to Him and to trust Him for the salvation of your soul. God knows that you would never love Him and never trust Him if He forced or compelled you to come to him, right, so you're like, why doesn't God force me, because God loves you, and he wants you to come to him on, uh, when you realize that you're a sinner, and you've done wrong, <clears throat> if he forced, or compelled you to give up your sinning, and your wrong way of living, God knows you would never love him, right, that you would never truly love him, God knows that if you could, uh, never come to him as an act of you, you could never trust him, Rather, you would resent him and be bitter against him as the one who has taken everything away from you. Right. So God lets you live your own way and do your own thing. You get drunk, you commit fornication, you lie, you cheat, you steal, you loaf around, you refuse to get a job and go to work, and you say, God's not against it because he has not judged me. Oh, yeah, because he's gracious and merciful. God is not against me because he hasn't punished me. If this was wrong, if God really hated this uh, like you say he does, God would have killed me by now or thrown me into hell. The truth of the matter is God uh, the truth of the matter is God that is winking. <clears throat> God is allowing you to continue on your course until you realize that drinking is destroying you, that sin is ruining your life. And that rebellion against God's word can't bring you any peace, joy, or happiness. And that is the God-honest truth right there. When you come to that conclusion as a result of God graciously and patiently allowing you to have your own way, you will be amazed that someone who has been so wrong, someone who has transgressed God's word so consistently, could still be loved by God. 
Amen. Then you will, because you do love him and you do trust him, come to God for the forgiveness of your sins. Amen. This is God's wisdom and God's great uh, grace in operation. Let me say again, there is a twofold object of God's grace to let men have the opportunity of proving in their own experience whether their course is good or not, and then to make it possible to extend mercy to them when they do see that they are wrong. Amen. <clears throat> In Galatians 6, 7-8, the Bible says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. My friend, when you see your mind, your health, your strength, your future, your very life slipping away, crumbling, decaying, turning to nothingness, as you see yourself racing, racing towards the grave, away from all that you hold dear, at last you must realize God is not mocked. When you see that everything you hold dear means nothing at all when compared to eternity, and you realize that you are alone in the world without hope and without God, then you will see that you didn't get away with anything. Right. You sowed some seeds, the seeds came up, and now you are reaping what you sowed. God is gracious. Amen. He will forgive you. He will save you. He will pardon. He will cleanse you. But... Oh, you must turn to him. Right, you must realize that Satan has lied to you in telling you that you have gotten away with something and that God doesn't hate sin. You have gotten away with nothing. God in his grace is allowing you to run your course until the time that you run to him. Point number four. Since all are sinners, God can offer grace to all without being partial. Amen. In Romans 3.23, the Bible states so simply, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now if all men have sinned, God offers grace, saving, forgiving, cleansing, and pardoning grace to all sinners. My friend, God has not been impartial. He has not been unjust. He has been perfectly just, for all men have sinned. <clears throat> People say, if God would ex exercise just justice and execute judgment upon all sin at once, that would prove that God is right. <laughs> no, don't you see that God's grace also and equally proves that he is right? Not only that he is right, but, oh, that he is loving and kind and merciful to sinful fallen man. Hallelujah for that. <clears throat> In Romans 11.26-36, the Bible says, and so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, There shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, capital D, the Deliverer, Jesus, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. For the gift and calling of God are without repentance. Uh, for as ye in times past have not believed God, yet have not now obtained mercy through their unbelief, even so have those, or have these also now not believed, that, that uh, through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon all. O oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are his judgments, and his ways past finding out! For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor, or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again? For of him, and through him, and to him, are all things, to whom be glory for ever. Amen. So what does God do? He lets the nation of Israel follow their own course and go their own way. Eventually, as a result of Israel's sin, the Gentile nations come to God and receive of God's grace and mercy and his salvation. Then what happens? The Gentile nations go into sin and into apostasy, and as a result of that, 
the Israelites come to God for grace and mercy and receive it. So the Bible says that all, yes all, are in unbelief. All, yes all, are sinners. All, yes everyone is a transgressor. And yet all may obtain mercy. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon all. Amen. Can you see the depths and riches of, of God's wisdom? They are unsearchable. His ways are past finding out. This is the marvel of God's dealing with the world in grace. Point number five. <clears throat> Justice and mercy are at opposite extremes from each other, but they meet in unison when grace is an operation. In Psalm 85, in Psalms 85, 1 and 2, this is stated so beautifully. Lord, thou hast been favorable unto thy land. Thou hast brought back the captivity of Jacob. Thou hast forgiven the iniquity of thy people. Thou hast covered all their sin. Selah. And in verse 10 we read, Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. The chief of sinners may be saved by God's grace and mercy. You say, but that can't be. It can't work because that would not be justice. God's justice demands a sacrificial payment for sin. Right. Well, all the Old Testament sacrifice, sacrifices pictured the sacrifice that would one day come. The Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Jesus Christ came and took the place of the guilty sinner that the guilty sinner might go free. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Right. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared for me, by the which we uh, will we are sac uh, sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Hebrews 10, 45, 10, and 14. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. 1 Peter 2.24 for as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold, from your vain conversation, received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. 1 Peter 1, 18-19. Amen. These verses make crystal clear the Bible truth that the offering of Jesus sac uh, sanctified God's justice. Amen. God's judgment on sin was meted out at Calvary when the Lord Jesus Christ took upon himself the sins of the world. His sacrifice was sufficient for all time. It involved the sins of every man and never needs to be repeated. Amen. <laughs> never needs to be repeated. Jesus Christ, through his propitiation, took the blow that should have fallen upon the sinner. The wrath that should have fallen upon the sinner fell upon him. As Redeemer, he is represented as buying back the sinner from sin's penalty. This, my friend, is God's fulfilling his justice, that he might bestow his grace. Amen for that. And he says, uh, let me read it to you from the very place that Philip read to the Ethiopian eunuch one grand day on the wilderness highway. Isaiah 53 3 through 11, speaking of Jesus Christ, states, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief, as, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But... He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, 
and the Lord had laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and uh, who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken, and he made his grave with the wicked, and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He had put grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul, and shall and shall be uh, sanctified. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. <clears throat> Amen. My friend, or my friends, God saw the travail of his son. God saw the suffering of his son. God saw the sacrificial payment that his son made on Calvary's cross. God's justice, God's dema uh, demand that sin be judged and paid for, was uh, s uh, satisfied in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. He faced the judgment of God that you might receive the grace of God. Hallelujah. Why would you die and pay for your own sins in hell when the Son of God has already suffered death and already paid the penalty for your sins, so that you would not have to. Yeah, why would you do that? Uh, that is what it is to have a Savior. That's what it is to be saved. It is not working for God. It is not serving God. It is not giving to God. It is not laboring for God. None of that provides you with a Savior. Right. God has done something. God has provided something and someone so that you might be freely saved. Everlasting life is a gift of God. They have a gift, a free gift. Man's case was so, uh, hopeless without a God-sent Redeemer. The effect of sin in your life was surely working your undoing, and it is right now if you have not been saved. Right, it is working your undoing if you have not been saved right now. The penalty of sin must sooner or later be met in eternal death. Your guilt was established beyond question in your conscience and in the Bible, and you cannot restore yourself by any human process. Such a situation demands the supreme sacrifice of love, and God here did not falter. Right, His only Son was equally unfaltering. Love spurred them on. Amen. There is no place for shadow, uh, shallow reasoning. There is no place for shallow reasoning or silly sentiment here. Right. There is no place for letting Christ come into your life. Yeah. You have no life. Right. We have no life outside of Christ. <clears throat> so when you say, let Christ come into your life. No. He says, give up your life and come to him. And he will give you his life, which is eternal life. So when you say something like that, I know that... We're trying to be sincere and stuff, but uh, <clears throat> that's not the right way. Let Letting Christ come into your life because we're dead in trespasses and sin, and Christ doesn't want to come into your life. He wants you to give up your life, which you have no life. You're dead. Dead in trespasses and sin, and he gives you his life. Amen? All right. So, again, you have no life. We have got to face some stern facts. Here we go. Agony and blood and darkness. Jesus Christ faced them on the cross. Someone had to suffer for sin. Jesus Christ did suffer. The just for the unjust. The sinless Christ dying for your sins. He cried in John 19.30, It is finished. Will you receive the finished sacrifice of Jesus Christ as the full, complete payment for your sins? There is no other hope. Of your soul being saved, right? There's no other hope of your soul, of your soul being saved. There is no other way you will ever see the kingdom of God. You will never enter the kingdom of God unless you are born again, and you cannot be born again by any means other than by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. 
He died to pay for your sins. He rose again for your justification. If you will believe on him, you will be saved. If you seek to do something for him in his name because of what he has done for you, such deeds will not save you. <clears throat> they cannot save you. God didn't tell you uh, to save yourself, right? He told you to believe on the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Believe and be saved. Amen. So there you have it. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Amen. All right. Well, that is the grace of God. Hallelujah. So there you have it. Hope you understood that, and I uh, hope you're paying full attention as I was going through this book. And again, you can find a copy of this book on the church website at www.jameswnox.org. And I encourage you to get this book along with uh, all his other books are good. Uh, this book is a good book, uh, Humanity of Christ. If you want to know about all of Jesus' humanity when he lived on this earth, uh, you can go find that book on the uh, church website also. Well, this will wrap up the Sure Foundation book study. And thank you for watching all these videos. And those that be going back and watching the replay, you can go back and find these on my Facebook page. Or you can go onto my YouTube page and find them there. Amen. And encourage you to get your own copy of this book and read it for yourself and study it out. Amen. All right. Well, that will wrap it up for this study. And Lord willing, next time I'll be bringing you a brand new study for the new year. So stay tuned to find out what that will be. Amen. Until then, may the Lord richly bless you and you all have a great and wonderful rest of your Monday. Amen. Bye-bye for now.